Welcome to the Low Carb Conferences podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Gerber, and we have a very special guest today, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. And how are you today, Gabrielle? Uh, I'm doing well, despite the increasing deepness of my voice. I'm yeah, I sensed, well. sensed a little frogginess in your voice. Well, that's what happens when you have two little kids. <laughs> well, get well soon. Thanks. So Dr. Lyon will be a speaker uh, at our conference next year in February, 2023. And uh, Dr. Lyon has a background in family medicine, functional medicine, and her main area of interest is maintaining muscle health as we age. So Dr. Lyon, if you can maybe spend a couple minutes and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, uh, your passion and your professional areas of interest. Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, first of all, I'm very excited to be speaking at this conference. Um, and I think that I will be able to provide the listener or the in-person attendee with a different perspective on low carb as it relates to muscle health and dietary protein. I have been extraordinarily fortunate to be trained by one of the leading protein researchers, and his name is Dr. Donald Lehman. And actually, he has mentored me for I hate to say this, two decades, so 20 years. And really, uh, that's where my career started in human nutrition, vitamin, mineral metabolism. I began my training in my undergraduate at the University of Illinois in nutritional sciences. And then, as you pointed out, I went to medical school. I, I actually did two years in psychiatry and then three years in family medicine. Following that, I actually did a postdoc, which was a combined clinical research fellowship at WashU. So I did a clinical fellowship in geriatrics and obesity medicine and a nutritional science research fellowship in at, you know, at WashU in St. Louis. My area of passion, there really was this moment where, you know, we were dealing with participants in the study. And one of the things that we were looking at was brain function and body composition. And I think in medicine, we all have this aha moment or this moment that really changes the trajectory of what we do and how we practice medicine. I imaged this woman's brain. She was in her late 40s, early 50s, and her brain, she'd always struggled with weight. And it wasn't an enormous amount of weight, but you know, you would consider that she had somewhat of a weight problem, whether it was 10 or 20 pounds, depending on what cycle of life she was in. And her brain looked like an Alzheimer's brain. And for those that have dealt with Alzheimer's or later life dementia, seeing this young woman in her late 40s, early 50s, knowing that in the next decade, what she had in store was devastating. And I realized that we, we were failing. And I felt personally responsible because as I spent so much time talking to her, doing cognitive testing, and we did lifestyle interventions, I realized that we had always been focusing on the wrong area for her. We were always focusing on weight loss, which obviously was really fat loss, but we were never focusing on muscle. And this was the moment where muscle-centric medicine was born. And this idea that we're not over fat, we're under muscled, and muscle is this organ of longevity that if we take care of it and we do everything that we can to optimize it, we can change the way our patients age and we age. Yeah, well, that's that's fascinating, uh, your, your background. And uh, it's interesting, rather than looking at fat loss for this um, Alzheimer's or pre-dementia, it's more an argument that uh, maintaining muscle mass is is the road to longevity. Yeah, I you know, I believe that when you ask the right question, then you come up with a solution. I think it's really peculiar that we have been struggling to fix this obesity problem for decades. And I think one of the reasons is we've been looking at the wrong tissue. We've been obsessed with body fat, we've been obsessed with obesity when in fact I feel like that's just symptomology. And these issues really believe, begin in skeletal muscle. You know, insulin resistance largely begins in skeletal muscle decades before it's seen in blood work. You know, it's not the only site, but based on body weight, it's 40% or more of body weight. Insulin resistance is a skeletal muscle issue. 
So I was going to ask you to dive into the science uh, regarding some of the mechanisms that that make uh, you know maintaining muscle function important, such as insulin resistance. Yeah. So this idea of insulin resistance, and I think that we can all, you know, I think on a very broad level, when we think about insulin resistance, insulin is a peptide hormone released from the pancreas, and it's necessary to move glucose into the cell. What happens is, and then when on the flip side, when we think about skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle is the site for 80 to 90% of glucose disposal. And glucose is carbohydrates from what we've been eating. So when we think about insulin resistance, insulin in and of itself in excess is toxic. Just like glucose is cytotoxic, meaning it can create cellular damage in all cells, while we don't necessarily need to eat dietary carbohydrates, we do need to generate glucose. And this idea that excess insulin and this uh, issue with insulin resistance, meaning the body becomes um, less effective, right? More resistant to this peptide hormone. And in fact, you end up making more insulin is a problem. <clears throat> when that becomes a problem, primarily when we think about skeletal muscle, as I just mentioned, skeletal muscle is the primary site for glucose disposal. As you can imagine, when skeletal muscle becomes affected, which by the way, when we look at studies and they say healthy sedentary individuals, there's no such thing. The idea that sedentary in and of itself is at all a healthy state is not how we are biologically designed. So mechanistically, when skeletal muscle as this primary site for glucose disposal becomes insulin resistant, one of the things that happens is the substrates accumulate within that tissue. So we think about extra adiposity or fat, uh, ectopic fat, whether it's fat that we see outside of our tissues or within our tissues, the skeletal muscle ends up looking like a marbled steak, okay. just to put it simply. Yeah. Well, I know there's various upregulation and downregulation through glut receptors and yeah, GLUT4 receptors. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And and I know that plays into insulin resistance. And so uh, the idea is we uh, develop, or as we lose muscle mass, we lose the ability to process uh, insulin uh, glucose uh, properly. We do. And, you know, so there is this idea that glucose is that, uh, excuse me, skeletal muscle as the metabolic regulator, it is the primary site. And of course, based on weight, that would make sense. What you're mentioning is the GLUT4. There's multiple different kinds of receptors for insulin and glucose into the different various cells. <clears throat> Primarily skeletal muscle is a GLUT4 receptor. When um, the issue becomes when tissue becomes insulin resistant and is also sedentary, what happens is it's like overpacking a suitcase. So there's glycogen, there's fatty acids, there's substrates that build up within that skeletal muscle that have nowhere else to go. It must go back into the bloodstream. So at this point, we see elevated levels of free fatty acids, elevated levels of blood glucose. So essentially, not only is skeletal muscle this primary site for disposal not working, but also as it just relates to overall mitochondrial health, overall energy, it, it is a primary defect in type 2 diabetes is skeletal muscle. Yes, uh, absolutely fascinating. And, you know, I, I, I love how you are focusing on the importance of muscle health and muscle energy. And, uh, you know, when you listen to um, some of the others speak about diet and lifestyle, they, they often forget the, the importance of, of muscle energy. And, and um, as we age, it becomes so important. And um, the sarcopenia aspect is um, something that we really all have to focus on. And, and it's, it's somewhat frustrating because you've heard this the same that some people say, well, you don't even have to exercise, just, just, um, you know, go out and eat this in, in this particular way. But as you say, we were not designed to be sedentary. Right. And one of the other things that I, I didn't mention earlier, and I know that we only have a small amount of time. So of course I'll dive more into this is that we see a generation of de novo you know, lipogenesis and inc increasing in triglycerides. When skeletal muscle has this defect, you know, there's again, there's nowhere for these substrates to go and they have to go somewhere. 
You know, the other thing yeah. that you mentioned is, is sarcopenia. And again, I'm a, uh, by training, I'm a geriatrician. And that was one of the things that we always looked at and always evaluated in clinic were these markers of strength. What's so interesting is while sarcopenia, which is a, a decrease in muscle mass and muscle function, and then of course there's diapenia, which is a decrease in strength. While we consider these diseases of aging, by the time they show up, they've likely been happening and, and in existence since our 30s. So sarcopenia is actually not a disease of aging. It actually is a muscle disease that likely starts decades earlier. Wow, that, that's fascinating. And by the way, just to tell the audience that um, I, I describe uh, you as one of our triple threats coming to the conference. And uh, that is that you have an interest in um, fitness, nutrition, and science. So we, we love the uh, the combination. And so, um, you know, what are the recommendations about uh, exercise? Can you give yeah. us some tips about that? Yeah. And, and one thing that we must understand is that exercise, depending on if a person is trained or untrained, has many applications. So I am going to provide baseline foundational things that everyone should be doing. Um, and of course, the amount and the volume of training, which is simply the amount that an individual would be doing or moving if it's weight, is really going to be tailored to their level of training per se. So if someone is untrained, they can get away with less volume and see a greater stimulus versus someone who, say, for example, is like my husband, who's a Navy SEAL, who's highly trained. And he needs a tremendous amount of volume to be able to get the same stimulus. When we think about resistant, when we think about muscle, we have to think about maintaining muscle mass and the health of that muscle mass and strength and size. And when I think about that, I think really about hypertrophy training. Hypertrophy training is resistance training. Now, it's not doing one rep max, which is how heavy can you go? It's really about creating enough volume, hitting each muscle group. I mean, depending on your training status, one to two times a week and really maxing out. You know, it's not about people will say, well, the reps should be eight to 12 reps, but your muscle doesn't count. Doesn't It's not counting. Okay, well, I, I've done now my 12th rep and I'm done. When you think about training, you really have to think about overall volume and where a person is at. So a great baseline recommendation would be three to four days of resistance training a week. I know that might sound like a lot, but it, it you know, again, we were designed, our body, our birthright is designed to be stressed. That's just the reality of it. So three to four days a week, resistance training. I do believe that a baseline foundation of cardiovascular activity, whether it's zone two training, some type of aerobic training is very important. Um, and, you know, the current guidelines are 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity. We could probably agree that that might actually not be enough, but it's a great place to start. And then I also recommend one day a week of high intensity interval training. And the literature would suggest that high intensity interval training should be four to 9% of an individual's training, which is not very much. So for example, in a 60 minute period, that breaks down to 2.4 minutes. High intensity interval training would be really, um, let's say you were on an airdyne bike or a rower. It would be going upwards of 80 to even 90% of your max output, your VO2 max. So it's, it's a pretty vigorous um, effort. It doesn't have to be that high. Again, you'll push it into what would be considered, you determine what is high intensity for that individual you push that individual up into that high intensity zone, <clears throat> excuse me, and then you allow them to recover. The amount of cellular stress is proportional in some regard to the amount of uh, activity implemented into it, which I think makes logical sense. The harder you work, the more you create cellular response. Fascinating. So if we have um, an older population that comes in to see us and sarcopenia is set in decades ago and they really haven't done anything about it, is there still hope? Or are there things that we can do with these people later in life? You can always get stronger. You can always improve. In fact, the body was designed for movement. 
So even if it means your cardiovascular activity is walking, it is phenomenally important, even if it is body weight activities. Individuals, again, the human physicality was designed for strength. You can always improve. We saw it. We saw it in our studies, saw it in the clinic. Even if, for example, an explosive movement is going from sitting to standing, you can always get yes. better. Yes. Well, that, you know, as, as a family doctor, we have patients coming in all the time and, and um, some of them don't do anything. I mean, most, and, and some of them walk and I say, but you have to add resistance training. So you, you have to work the body or um, you're not going to have any long-term benefits. And so uh, this is really important. And, um, you know, I know for myself, I can interject um, I made a resolution post pandemic to get back to the gym and I proved that somebody in their sixties can build up muscle mass again. And uh, that's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, and you know, I do think that there, I think that one of the aspects that we do need to address is that mind muscle connection, very, you know, using exercise as a tool for concentration. There's evidence to suggest the more focused you are in the moment, in the training, of the muscle group that you are training that you actually can make better improvements. Well, so don't go, yeah. Don't get me into mindfulness because that's one area I love. And so part, part for myself going to the gym is, is very mindful and it just clears my head and it gives me focus. And, you know, I had just basically over the pandemic had just been running and wasn't going to the gym was, and was just, just thinning and, 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 just, you know, just didn't feel well and then went back. And uh, so really getting some benefits and I kind of have to just throw in there, ask you some questions. Do you think there's any role for um, exercise supplements? Um, I do. Yeah, I do. And especially as individuals age, I, I also want to mention something else. One of the reasons that we have to shift our focus to muscle as an endocrine organ, muscle is an endocrine organ. When you contract skeletal muscle, it releases myokines. And there is this exercise effect known as almost as an exerkine effect. When you contract skeletal muscle, it releases these myokines that actually interface with the brain. You're very interested in mindfulness. It helps with neurotropic factors. It helps with brain regeneration. It also influences the way in which we use our substrates, glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids above and beyond just the exercising muscle. These myokines, one in particular, the most studied myokine is interleukin-6. And interleukin-6 actually helps direct the use of substrates, which this is fascinating. This is the what the muscle is producing and now creating a systemic-wide effect rather than just, say, mitochondria and um, the utilization of fuels. So I, I just want to interject that, that this idea of muscle and this muscle as an endocrine organ is, is so underappreciated. And, and I really believe it's the next frontier of medicine. And then you just got me off on a tangent, which I'll, yeah. I'll blame you because yeah. you were telling me that you were in your sixties and now all of a sudden putting on muscle. Let me go back to supplementation. There are a few supplements that I really believe are incredibly valuable for individuals who are more mature. <laughs> um, so we'll start with that. Number one, creatine. Number two, there's evidence to suggest primarily in postmenopausal women and really all people, but primarily postmenopausal women seem to have greater benefits from uh, omega-3 fatty acids as it relates to skeletal muscle. They think that there's some impact on the ribosomes, but Nonetheless, there seems to be some beneficial impact of omega-3 fatty acids, fish oil uh, supplementation on skeletal muscle, primarily in women. Obviously, vitamin D is very important, not just for energy. You know, I, I say that kind of flippantly, energy, you know, to feel less fatigued, but for balance and stability, there are vitamin D receptors on skeletal muscle and low vitamin D status makes individuals a fall risk. When individuals fall and if they break a hip, they're, you know, that's devastating, which, you know, we can all attest to that. Yeah. Those are the top, the top supplements that I really think everybody should take. And then of course, as you kind of go down the list, there's a multivitamin, which I, you know, I do think multivitamins are very beneficial. And of course, depending on age, CoQ10 or ubiquinol, things of that nature. 
So these are things that I personally do myself. And, right. and so this year I, I finally started taking creatine about six grams a day. Perfect. And in addition, maybe you have some experience that I've been taking nitric oxide precursors, okay. L-citrulline. And I, I, I thought there was testosterone in it. It was laced with testosterone. That's incredible. I, 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 at least I, I, I don't think the product is, but um, I've noted such improvements going to the gym and and, um, you know, a gain in strength and, and recovering uh, very easily. And so I, I guess for the, what, what do you know about nitric oxide? Precursor? Nitric oxide is a, a vasodilator. And as we age, the plasticity of the vesicles decreases. There's a decrease in what's called capillary perfusion, meaning the blood and the nutrients to tissues, including skeletal muscle decreases. When you add an agent like uh, citrulline or arginine, which is an amino acid, um, it is a precursor for NO2, which is nitric oxide, which allows for vasodilation. So essentially it makes blood flow better and also nutrients being able to flow to whatever particular tissue is better. Yeah. And so even to mention that Big Pharma actually has drugs to treat blood pressure that uh, is based on the mechanism of nitric oxide. Very cool. So, you know, what I, I've been recommending to my patients, and look, I've done some research as well, is that, it, you know, nitric oxide precursors uh, are a natural way to treat blood pressure. You know, uh, also, as you said, blood flow may help with brain and energy, yeah. erectile dysfunction. It has all these potential benefits. Do you know one other source naturally of... Um, a way to improve NO2? Please. High protein diets, more optimal protein diets because of arginine. So there's variations in the literature where some people are supplemented with L-arginine and other people are not. And some show effect and, and some don't. And one of the reasons is, is because one of the reasons that I believe is that their diets are not controlled for protein. So those individuals on a lower protein diet are going to show a bigger and more robust response to things like L-arginine because they could use more of it or even sertraline or NO, an NO2, a vasodilator. Yeah, that, that's great. And then just backing up to um, creatine, creatine has really been studied for years, you, you know, as, an, as you know, in elderly population, and it just shows that uh, their muscle function improves. Yes, and also brain function. So. So yeah, that, well, that's, that's good. That's great stuff. And then um, just switching to an, another area is um, of course, how much protein <laughs> and this is quite a hot topic. And especially actually in the low carb community, um, you know, I think there is a time and place for everything. And I think that we eat in seasons. I will tell you that depending on what an individual's goal is. For example, for you, my friend, if your goal was to optimize for muscle mass, then you would be looking at the upwards of 1.6 to even one gram per pound ideal body weight. And that would be, be dosed in very particular meal patterns to optimize your muscle mass. So one gram per pound ideal body weight if an individual's goal is really to optimize for skeletal muscle. Keep in mind, when we talk about dietary interventions, um, the maturity, like that's that's my word for aging. Do you like it? The mature level, the, the level of maturity. <laughs> when we are young, we have a tremendous amount of flexibility. An individual, perhaps really what matters to them is going to be the protein hierarchy. How, how much protein are they getting in a 24-hour period? However, as capillary perfusion decreases, as sex hormones decrease, as the ability to spend more time in the gym or effective time in the gym decreases, understanding that dietary protein for an older population has a needle threshold response. And this is really based on one of the branch chain amino acids, which is one of the essential amino acids, leucine. Now, um, fortunate enough, I had mentioned earlier that I, I happen to be trained by one of the world leading protein experts. He made this discovery that this idea that there is a meal threshold response to dietary protein. And that's really based on this leucine amount. So one gram per pound ideal body weight, as an individual is more mature, we really need to think about optimizing 
the muscle protein response per meal. And that would be anywhere from a minimum of 30 grams of protein upwards to 50 grams of protein per meal. Yeah. So I was, I was just trying to imagine a, a gram per pound is what you were saying. And that's uh 150, you know, it's going to vary for, for uh, different people, but that could be hundred. And if you're building muscle, 150 grams could be 200 grams. And, and then, um, you know, there's always this concern, well, you know, how's this going to affect mTOR that we're supposed to limit, limit our protein. And um, I think I, I would love lot... to have a comment. I would love to make a comment on that. Sure. So mTOR, which is mechanistic target of rapamycin is actually in all cells. It is exquisitely sensitive to protein really only in skeletal muscle. mTOR in liver, mTOR in pancreas, mTOR in brain, mTOR in other tissues are actually much more exquisitely sensitive to overall energy balance, excess calories, excess carbohydrates, not necessarily protein. So this idea that we need to restrict mTOR and somehow targeting dietary protein is not accurate. What a much better thought is, you know, also exercise stimulates mTOR. So this idea that exercise and dietary protein are, you know, you know, mTOR is bad, so we should decrease it. That makes no sense, especially around the conversation of dietary protein. Thank, thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, what about the role in carbohydrate and fat? I mean, yeah. does it have to be a strict keto, low carb diet? Does it, does it depend? No. I mean, so for me, you know, I believe that there's an opportunity to experiment with any nutritional plan a person chooses. I personally um, am in the camp of a higher carb, a higher protein diet. I think that it works better. Again, I'm a trained geriatrician. My perspective is all about muscle health. From a muscle health perspective, again, if you want to have carbohydrates, it's okay, but you're going to have to earn it. Um, but from a dietary protein perspective, I do think that there are ways to optimize for dietary protein, which are much more robust than, again, is really kind of being presented in general. The RDA hasn't changed for the last 30 years, and it's 0.8 grams per kilogram. So that means that for some reason, in the last 30 years, either A, there's been no nutritional research, which is not true, or Number two, no one has really paid attention to dietary protein. Sure. Well, look, I think the area is complex, so it depends all on your age, your sex, your level of activity, where your macronutrient mix should be, your level of insulin resistance. And, um, you know, for myself, I think that, uh, um, you know, insulin and hormones are very important, but um, also calories play into it. So energy totally. balance. And uh, I always want the audience to understand that uh, these two things are not mutually exclusive, if you agree. I do. I do. Absolutely. Yeah. And so what will be fun at our conference next year is that uh, we're having a um, variety of speakers with different opinions, actually, um, uh, fr from the calorie camp, from the hormone camp and in between. And uh, we're, we're going to look at, uh, you know, again, the fitness and the nutrition and science. So this should be a, a fantastic event. And we're really excited that uh, you'll be joining us for the first time next year. Yeah, I'm thrilled. So, so go ahead. No, thank you. I'm thrilled. Yeah. So just to ask you, I, I know you just recently returned from a, a speaking engagement. What is it that uh, you enjoy about uh, going to these events in person? I really do like connecting and I do like educating. There is a need for it. And I feel that those that have the capacity to do have a responsibility to do so. Um, you know, I think it's a responsibility. Excellent. And uh, for myself, I just enjoy um, g getting everyone together in, in one place that are all like-minded and passionate about uh, health and prevention. Love that. And there's always so much to learn from each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we're much stronger together, right? As a, as a community. I think that being part of a team is really important and being part of a community is really important, especially for for providers that actually 
are in the trenches seeing patients. It's it's very valuable. It's important. Well, it's great to have you here today and and to to join us next next year, Gabrielle. And how can our audience uh, find out more about you? Yep, you can go to my website, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. I actually have a new podcast. Is the Dr. Gabrielle? It's a podcast YouTube, the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show where I try to have these very transparent conversations with other experts. I'm hoping you'll come on. Uh, we'll do it in person in um, in Denver, as a matter of fact. And of course, I'm very active on Instagram and Twitter, and not so much on Facebook. I have a free protocol that individuals can download. If they're interested in applying to be a patient, they can also do that through the website. Okay. Well, thanks, Gabrielle. And um uh, we look forward to seeing you at our event next year and also to our audience. Uh, you can attend both live and in person, and you can find uh, more information about us at lowcarbconferences.com. So thanks again, Gabrielle, and uh, Thank we'll stay in touch. Thanks.